we are on 140, 100, we start with that thing again. We'll quickly run through that sentence and proceed. I curve the vacant ether into space, a huge expanding and contracting breath harbor the fires of the universe. I struck out the supreme original spark and spread its past ranked armies through the inane. Manufactured the stars from the occult radiances, marshaled the platoons of the invisible dance. I formed Earth's beauty out of atom and gas and build from etheric plasm the living man. So he is quickly tracing the entire course of evolution up to the arrival of man. He starts from nothing and then using the Sankhya principle of materialization, of material creation, he is arriving at the stage of man, which means that man is a product of matter. He is a product of matter. There is nothing like any higher being entering into matter and giving rise to, in the evolutionary stage, the species we call man, the mental being. Now, we have got a very significant phrase right in the first line. I curved the vacant ether into space. Vacant ether. Now, what is that vacant ether? Ether, of course, stands for Akash. It is out of Akash that I produced space. What is that vacant ether? He is asserting that after all, this whole process started with nothing. The whole thing started out of void, empty, vacant. That itself is the ether, as if the void is first producing the first formation of the void in its creation is the ether. And then start coming other elements. Akash, Vayu, Tejas, Apas, and Prithvi. So vacant ether is an assertion of death, assertion by death, that the whole creation here has come out of nothing, out of the void. He's not saying that somebody else brought it down here. No, there was nothing here. And it is I who brought it out, out of nothing, all these things you see. So who is man after all then? He is the product of this nothing. Through all the stages it has come, the stages to the position of nothing. And with the arrival of man, he is testing very rapidly. Then, Thought came, sorry, then thought came in and spoiled the harmonious world until before the arrival of man, everything was in order. Everything was in perfect place. Life was enjoying life. Matter was happy with its forms and beauty and whatever to call it. But the moment man came, then he started playing mischief. It is he who has created all these problems. It is he, mind, who has created this disharmony. Spoil the harmonious world. Now, of course, for him, that harmonious world is a kind of a world of status quo. Let it remain as it is. And we are happy, you see, status quo. There is no further problem. But man comes and spoils it. That spoiling in a positive sense means that you are removing, you are knocking off the status quo and trying to go forward. 
that he is not admitting. The purpose of mind is to remove the status quo and make progress that he is not admitting. But he says, whatever harmony was there, that got spoiled because of the arrival of man, because of this thought. Then thought came in and spoiled the harmonious world. Matter began to hope and think and feel tissue and nerve, both joy and agony. Before that, there was no question of joy or agony. It was as it is, that's all. The inconscient cosmos strove to learn its task. Cosmos learn, strove to learn its task. Strove, because mind is struggling. It is trying to understand. And what is the task? What it is for? What is the purpose behind all these things? The inconscient cosmos strove to learn is that what it is supposed to do that started haunting man, the arrival of man, all these things started happening. You see. The inconscient cosmos strove to learn is that an ignorant personal God was born in mind. See, he is telling very correctly all those things. First, you have nothing but the void. Then comes inconscience. Then comes ignorance. So ignorance is really a great, great, great advance in the field of the beginning of creation, in the, at the beginning of creation. Out of inconscious ignorance is a reason. It means that you have really made tremendous progress. You have really made There was nothing. Matter came. It is a progress in a way. Matter came, life came, man came, ignorance came. So these are actually stages of progress out of the void, you see. So we should not feel sorry that we are ignorant people. No, we are not ignorant. We have really made great, great, great progress in this creation. Out of nothing, you see. Our knowledge may be half knowledge, maybe partial knowledge, maybe incomplete knowledge, but that is there now, which is totally absent until now. The inconscient cosmos strove to learn its task. An ignorant personal God was born in mind. So personal God. You see, it's not a question of universe because it is I who create project God. It is a kind of an anthropomorphism. The God of man is like a man. The God of an elephant is like an elephant. The God of a tiger is like a tiger, you see. You project your own personality and call it God, you see. A personal God, therefore it's a personal God, you see, was born in mind. So actually, therefore, according to him, there is nothing like God. It is the creation of your mind. And to understand, invented, reasons, love. So you have created God all right. And now you want to understand God, what he is. So you start rationalizing, you start producing logic, arguments and all that. Thing. He must be like this, he must be like that, etc., etc. Et and to understand invented reasons law. To understand invented reasons law. In other words, you build up philosophies, you build up theologies. This is God, this is God, this is God, this is not God, this is not God, etc. Et <laughs> And to understand invented reasons, law, the impersonal was thrown back to man's desire. A trouble rocked the great world's blind, still heart. And nature lost her wide, immortal calm. So kind of a calm which was there on nature before the arrival of man. Trees are there, mountains are there, rivers are there, animals are there. Everything is there. But they are kind of static. But that thing is now lost with the arrival of man. Nature lost her wide immortal calm. Thus came this warped incomprehensible scene. So actually the problem, the puzzle is with man with his mind. 
it has become incomprehensible he wants to understand with mind he cannot understand with mind it becomes incomprehensible he has created in reason he has invented logic theories and what not still he can't grasp what that really is you see thus came this warped incomprehensible sin of souls enmeshed in life's delight and pain and matter sleep and matter's mortality of being in nature's prison waiting death and consciousness left in seeking ignorance so that is what happened you are left now your consciousness whatever awareness you have got that is seeking it is an ignorance which is moving forward seeking trying to understand ignorance is trying to understand what ignorance is in a way that is self is a progress yeah that is self is a progress ignorance is trying to understand what ignorance is you see and consciousness left in seeking ignorance this is the world in which thou moves so madam this is the creation this is how it has happened and you are living in this world and you are dreaming of this and that and what not you are betraying yourself you are not following logic of things at all you see this is the world in which thou must astray in the tangled pathways of the human mind tangled pathways of the human mind well this is a perfect description of the conflicting theories we keep on producing ages after ages is it dvaita is it advaita is it vishta advaita <laughs> all kind of philosophies are thrown out like that and each one has a truth dvaita the duality has a truth in it the non duality has a truth also in it a specialized kind of duality vishta advaita vishta specific that is also true that god is different than creation no god and creation are the same no they are totally different it is god who has created in a certain manner this creation so this keep on arguing like that endlessly and there is no resolution of argument at all possible impossible so tangled pathways in the human mind for centuries people have been quarreling ramanujam shankaracharya all these great acharyas of the middle ages of india they had built up their own theories and their own philosophy based on certain type of spiritual realizations there is no doubt that they have got spiritual realizations but they were exclusive they were not able to really comprehend and put them all together see therefore each one is trying to understand explain rationalize the earlier scriptures vishishta advaita will interpret gita in his own manner advaita will interpret the gita in his own manner advaita will interpret the gita again in his own manner so that is how it keeps on going on you see means intellect is at its full play this is the world in which thou wouldst astray the tangled pathways of the human mind so death is telling correctly what he says this is not wrong you see because you are trapped in that thing in the issue is circling of the human life searching for thy soul and thinking god is here <laughs> you think that god is here because after all you are a mental creature thought is your best faculty so you think that god is here but where is god everything has come up from me from the void first came the ether then came all those elements etc etc et et then came man then came his thought then came all these philosophies where is god then you don't need god this is exactly the kind of an argument which stephen hawking has been proposing you see all along i don't need god i don't need god he says you see but here's my business to say whether god is there or whether he needs god or not because it is not really in the domain of his physical formulation you derive you base your theories of physics on certain principles it does not does not come at all there any where at all if physics is based on the principle of 
empirical rationalism that on the basis of observation you build up your thought structure then you are making certain progress but here there is no question of observation at all there is no question of empiricism at all then how can you even talk of whether god exists or not it is not in your domain you have no business to say whether he exists or not you have really no business to say it because it does not really come in the compass of the physical formulation you see searching for thy soul and thinking so that is the materialist argument which is puts very strongly and that is kind of highlighting it giving his own version of that thing you see but there is room for soul or place or god in the brute immensity of a machine this is exactly what stephen hawking is saying a brief history of time if you read his brief history of time this is exactly what he said brief history of time was written maybe 30 years ago but shaben wrote this thing <laughs> in 1945 you see sorry yeah in 1945 46 you see long long before the arrival of stephen hawking this is the world in which thou moves astray in the tangled pathways of the human mind in the issueless circling of thy human life searching for thy soul and thinking god is here but where is room for soul or place for god in the brute immensity of a machine so he is really putting the argument of the materialist very strongly a transient breath thou takes for thy soul so your brief life that you call is a soul born from a gas a plasm a sperm a gene <laughs> a magnified image of man's mind for god a shadow of thyself thrown upon space so after all it is the mental imagination which is projected on the wall and you call that god it is your own shadow that you see and call it god there is really no god at all there if you are not there the god does not exist at all a shadow of thy self thrown upon space into interposed between the upper and neither void like consciousness reflects the world around in the distorting mirror of ignorance or upwards turns to catch imagined stars imagined stars there are really no stars but you imagine them you are talking of stars because there is ignorance because there is night interposed between the upper and neither void now he is admitting that he is void alone is not the void maybe there is somebody else also which is absolutely non manifest therefore it is a void between the first nothingness and the last nothingness he stand as been from the last nothingness thinking coming up but there could also be perhaps another nothingness the first nothingness it interposed between the upper and neither void upper void the non manifest supreme the neither void the non manifest has disappeared into non manifest <laughs> thy consciousness reflects the world around in the distorting mirror of ignorance and therefore you are in between hanging in ignorance and therefore this is a distortion of it so actually when you look at the mirror you see your own image is it really the true image of yours it is not it is not <laughs> not only it is ulta pita <laughs> inverted now that thing you really don't know whether it is a totally non interactive mirror whether there are distortions 
there are ups and downs in the mirror which will cause minute distortions and all that thing you see. It may not be you are happy, but that may not be really your true image. You, got, you assume that the mirror is a non-interactive medium. When you are throwing yourself on that thing, your image itself is perhaps distorted. The surface may not be absolutely plain, absolutely transparent. It may not be neutral to all the shades of light. Some light is prominent, some light is suppressed and that kind of a thing. So it may not be really true image of yours at all. Say. So the mirror is always a distorted mirror. You cannot have a true mirror at all, you see. In fact, there's the whole problem. In the distorting mirror of ignorance, so that is what mirror is. Ignorance is there present already in the mirror. <laughs> in the sense. We have to see our face. Huh? Huh? We have to see our face. You think you're happy, but it, it is not so. You see. You feel it may not be so. You, you are assuming that the mirror is perfect. A photographer is taking your photo. Ha, what a beautiful photo. But you don't know how many stages through which the whole process goes. And at every stage, there can be distortion. There can be departures from the original. Even in your eye, there can be departures from every stage, you see. You, you are not really your true self there. The, the famous image of Plato's cave. The world of ideas, he says that all what we are here is nothing but an image cast on a wall in the cave. You are sitting in a cave, cave, and you have absolutely nothing available. What is there behind you? Now, behind the cave, there is a small little window through which the light can come and it is projected on the cave wall. And people come and go, the cars rush through and the cameras move and all that kind of thing. And you see everything happening on the wall. And that you call as the world of ideas projected in your world. Yeah, God is like this. The cameras are like that. The cars are like that. They are moving. Now, the point is, again, Plato is assuming that that wall on the cave is distortion free. That the light which is coming here is not going to give rise to changes in what that object is. You see, it is bound to happen. The distortions are bound to happen. If the cave wall is absolutely flat, flat, if there are no pockets of absorbing a particular shade of light more than the other, then perhaps you can understand but you are assuming it. You have no way of checking whether it is true. So the image which is cast on the wall of the cave is not really the true image of the ideal which is there behind. The camel which is going behind you may be a different creature altogether. And what you are seeing is the camel moving on the wall there. And you are happy, but that camel and that camel, there may be a difference of world between the two. <laughs> so that is how the image gets distorted in our conception, in factual life also, in the objective life, as well as in terms of interpretation through our mental faculties. There is a bound, there is bound to be distortion. You have an image of God. And you want to see the image of God in your own image that way. It's not true. You are quite far away. It is only by some other kind of identity of the object that you can get the true knowledge about the object. Not without that. It is bound to be a difference between the subjective and the objective in that sense interpose between the upper and neither void. The consciousness reflects the void, uh, reflects the world around in the distorting mirror of ignorance or upwards turns to catch its imagined stars or 
if a half truth is playing with the earth through its light on a dark shadowy ground it touches only and lives a luminous smudge is true the same image again immortality thou claimest for thy spirit but immortality for imperfect man a god who hurts himself at every step so what is the definition of man the definition of god is he is one who hurts himself at every step he is hurting himself at every step imperfect man man a god who hurts himself at every step is true <laughs> so according to him he is telling you correct thing to say would be a cycle of eternal pain so you want immortality of that kind it be a miserable immortality you won't be happy at all forget about that understand thing immortality thou claimest for thy spirit but immortality for imperfect man a god who hurts himself at every step so like that you say apasa he is giving you a lot of definitions of what man is what philosophy is what uh, all the things man is a god who hurts himself at every step <laughs> so you are you want a homework write an essay on man a god who hurts himself at every step <laughs> write a long essay and bring it next time <laughs> would be a cycle of eternal pain wisdom and love the climax as thy right well this is what savitri has been claiming and he is rebutting her claim see man is an imperfect creature and he is hurting himself at every step so what will you do with love and wisdom again the same thing wisdom and love the climax as as thy right but knowledge in this world is errors make what you are calling because after all he is talking of ignorance that is the ignorance and it is bound to commit error because of ignorance but knowledge in this world is errors make now he is very careful also that it is in this world knowledge is an error in this world knowledge is an error what is knowledge a brilliant procurus of nations <laughs> so she is a procurus knowledge is feminine she brings things as a supplier to nations so whatever nations wants that is supplied by this knowledge a brilliant procurus and human love a posture on earth stage so that is the definition of knowledge and love according to death according to death knowledge is the procurer of nations love is a posturer on earth who imitates with verb a fairy dance very cruel philosophy very disappointing very discouraging it pushes our spirit down below you see but knowledge in this world is errors may a brilliant progress of nation now this is bound to be there knowledge is bound to be there with all its error love is a posturer it is bound to be there as long as there is ignorance and ignorance is there is bound to be there as long as death is present so really if knowledge has not to make error if love has to be spontaneous free without posturing death has to go away in other words he is saying that look i am there therefore knowledge cannot be true knowledge love cannot be true love because i am there he is rather asserting himself in that sense you see but knowledge in this world is errors make a brilliant progress of nation and human love 
a pasturer on earth stay who imitates with verb a period dance. This word, word procures, procures is of course feminine. In the common language, it is used for the supplier of your needs, supplier of needs. In the vital language, Procurus is one who supplies prostitutes to people. A brilliant Procurus of nations, you see, who will, he imitates with verb a period dance and extract. What does he say? Yes. <laughs> the one who the, the money shop is yeah well <laughs> yeah she yeah. she arranged she arranged to procure to get procure yeah 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 but procure see procure has a different shades of meaning also no, the supplier the supplier of the needs of the king of the royal family whatever supplies are required by the royal family the king is not going to go and buy in the market. Somebody has to procure for him. <laughs> and extract press from hard experience. Man's knowledge cast in the barrels of memory. So he is now the, uh, 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 he is giving the image of making wine, you see. <laughs> Man is an extract from hard experience. Man's knowledge cast in the barrels of memory had the hard sever of a mortal draught. So they taste the pungency is of that kind, you see. He is giving the how you extract wine from a grape. The whole image here, an extract pressed from hard experience, barrels of memory, sever of draught. So all these words belong to the process of making wine. Yes. Why does he use this? Why does he use this? Yeah. Why does he use that? Uh, he he is a God is man. He is giving you man. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is what he is. And he has a harsh sever, a sweet secretion from the erotic glands. <laughs> so uh, he is coming back to that now. Flattering and torturing the burning nose. Love is a honey and poison in the breast, drunk by it as the nectar of the gods. So that is the violet love of the vital. <laughs> As human wisdom is no great browed power. And love, no gleaming angel from the skies. Well, it cannot be because Monsieur, you are there. Love cannot be a gleaming angel from the skies because you are present there. You see. If they aspire beyond earth's dullard air, arriving sunwards, with frail wings and wing, how high could reach that forced unnatural flight? Now here, if they aspire, who is this they? No, he has not talked of people at all. In fact, he's talking of man. Not people. So they. No. <laughs> no. Men, women, no. <laughs> well, he is he is referring to back to wisdom and love. They. As human wisdom and love, no gleaming angel. They is wisdom and love. <laughs> they have to have the immediate context, you see. 
Thus, human wisdom is no great broad power and love no gleaming angel. So that power and angel, they stands for that great broad power. If they aspire beyond earth's dullard air, arriving sun voice with frail wings and wings. So you have got wings either made of wax or wax like. Yeah, so you can't really go very high up, very close to the sun. The wings will melt. Yeah. Arriving sunwards with frail wings and wings, how high could reach that pose and natural fly? It cannot go so close to the sun, the sun at all. In fact, there is a mythological story in India. Uh, I think it was Garuda's brother who had wings and wings. He had to put on, and then he was trying to catch the sun. They got burnt. It fell down. Yeah. Obviously. But not on earth can divine wisdom reign. That is absolutely true. And not on earth can divine love be found. So he's again talking of love and wisdom. You see, constant. They, yeah. Yeah, well, he doesn't say that. Yeah. But he's talking only about that. Yeah, For him, that is the only love. Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah. He doesn't know anything. Yeah, he doesn't know anything about it. Yeah. So it doesn't mean. Uh, yeah. Like but God. not on earth can divine wisdom. No, he's talking now. So this, there is no question of divine wisdom and divine love but that's what he said. coming here at all. You see. But not on earth can divine wisdom reign. And not on earth can divine love be found. So that they again stands for wisdom and love. Heaven born, only in heaven can they live. Yes, you are happy there, live there. Forget about earth. <laughs> or else, there too, perhaps, they are shining dreams. <laughs> You imagine that there is pure love there, there, there is faultless wisdom there, but that is your imagination, that is your dream. We don't know what it will be, you see. <laughs> Nay, he is not all thou art and doest a dream. What you have been talking about, is that not really a dream at all? It's a dream. And he is making it very forcefully, you see. Nay, is not all thou art and doest a dream? Yes, it is a dream, your imagination. See the beauty of this line compared to the other line. It's a perfectly monosyllabic line. Each word separate. Nay, is not all thou art and doest a dream? Thy mind and life are tricks of matter's force. After all, they come from matter. Matter has created these glands, these secretions, this wine, whatever you want to call it, you see. <laughs> this drought. Thy mind and life are tricks of matter, suppose. If thy mind seems to thee a radiant sun, if thy life runs a swift and glorious dream, this is the illusion of thy mortal heart. Dazzled by a ray of happiness or light. So this is a, just a dream, a hallucination. In fact, it's an illusion. It is not there at all. It is made of your imagination. It does not exist at all. It's dazzled by a ray of happiness or light. If the mind seems to be a radiant sun, it is. So in other words, the radiance of the sun is after all due to your mind. It is not really there. It is not really there. It is you think the alien sun, it's not really there at all. You think there is God, it's not really there at all, you see. You think there is love, it's not there at all, really, you see. Thy mind seems to be, see again, he is talking of, see, that combination going on, wisdom and love. That is the entire argument on which he is saying. They stands for wisdom and love. Now, wisdom and love, 
are amplified further by mind and life. If thy mind, if the life, wisdom and love. So he is quite coherent in his formulation, his argument. You see, <laughs> this is illusion of thy mortal heart. Dazzled by a ray of happiness of light or light, deceive the illusion of thy mortal heart. Okay, let me admit that that the sun is radiant, that there is glory and all that is but an illusion of my mortal heart. Will that be so if my heart becomes immortal? <laughs> It cannot. Heart, your mortal heart, it will always remain mortal heart. There is no question of it becoming immortal. So, in verse, for you, it will be always so, an illusion, a dream. Mortal will remain always immortal. Important to live by their own right, divine, convinced of their brilliant unreality. When their supporting ground is cut away, these children of matter into matter die. So that is the there is no question of immortality at all. These children, who are these children? Mind and life, wisdom and love. They are born from matter into matter; they will disappear. But he does not tell us. Why they have come out of matter at all, and why should they die again in matter? That argument is left hanging. If they come out of matter, okay, let me admit for a minute they come out of matter. Let me also admit that they will go back into matter. But he is not telling me why at all, even for a short little while, for the small period, they should really come out at all. What is the purpose of their emerging from matter before they again disappear into matter? They come here, quiver, stay for a while, and disappear for what? You see, that he is not telling us. Conveys of their brilliant unreality when the supporting ground is cut away. These children of matter into matter die. Of course, he is telling us when they will disappear. He is telling us when the supporting ground is cut away, they will disappear into matter. Who is going to cut away their ground? <laughs> That he is not telling us. <laughs> That he is not telling us. You see, their supporting ground is cut away, and why should he cut away? I mean, is it his fancy? Is it imagination? Is is his freak or whatever it is? Why? That he is keeping. So philosophically, his argument is a little weak argument. It is full of holes. You see. When their supporting ground is cut away, these children of matter into matter die. Even matter. Now, okay, all these people have come out of matter. These, of course, here wisdom and love. They have come from matter. But what is matter after all? Matter vanishes into energies vague. There is really no matter at all. Matter, matter itself. Is energy. So he has read Einstein's theory of relativity, <laughs> and he is banking upon Einstein that after all, matter is a product of energy, and therefore matter will disappear into energy. So according to him. The primary importance 
does not go to matter. It goes to energy. Energy is more enduring than matter. Energy, power, creative force, whatever you want to call it, is more enduring than matter. Now here, you have a very beautiful construction. Even matter vanishes into energies vague. He is using the word vague as a noun. So, well, normally we see indistinct, which is not clear, something like that. But vague itself is an entity of some kind of an obscurity. Some kind of an obscurity. It is into energy's obscurity, it disappears. Even matter vanishes into energy's vague. You see now, energy is vague, position of vague, vague, he is using as a noun. It's not adjective here. Vague, let me tell you exactly. Yeah, well, energy is vague, empty or obscure substance. That's what I was saying. Pardon me? A vague is used purely as a noun here, as a noun. No, no, no. Into energy is vague. Into energy is obscurity. Obscur yeah. Obscurity is a noun. Obscure is an adjective. How does he use your English French? No, 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 this is the, is generally an adjective. Vague is a, vague is an adjective, generally, but here the use of the word is an, as a noun. Yeah, it is obscurity yeah, in that. An obscure substance. He is using it as a noun. So he is he is using Cambridge English. <laughs> Even matter, so ultimately what is matter after all? It is energy. Mm -hmm. And into the vagueness of energy, it disappears. In other words, you can't really figure out what it is. You can't figure out at all what it is, you see. Pardon me? Yeah, we can't figure out, yeah. Vanishes into energy is vague, and energy is a motion of old not, of nothing, of zero, of the void. So all matter, life, wisdom, whatever you want to call it, finally they disappear into the nothing. Yeah. But uh, you see, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, he has not told us exactly how things happen from one step to the other step, you see. That, that uh, chemistry is not, that process is not really desc is described that you see. You are making a statement, but I want to know the process by which I can really realize that kind of a thing. Like a formula, I go to the laboratory and produce all those things. Okay, life disappears, matter disappears becomes energy, energy becomes vague, becomes not. How? You see? <laughs> so 
Yeah, no, he says energy is a motion of old knot. The foundation is that void, old. Out of that nothing, that old knot, out of that nothing, things have come. How it has come? The knot got stirred by itself. <laughs> the void stirred itself. And the stirring of the void itself is the beginning of the manifestation of energy. And then that energy becomes matter, matter becomes life, life becomes mind, etc., etc. So all that thing will go back into universe, it will become totally motionless, nothing. That is the layer of this entire creation. Everything will disappear. In fact, that is what death stands for. That nothing can exist in manifestation. Everything will go back, lapse into that starless void, unmoving, motionless void. You see. So, so in that sense, he proves to be a great denier of existence. He is showing his full character here. Even matter vanishes into energy is vague and energy is a motion of old knot. How shall the ideal's unsubstantial use be painted stiff on earth's vermilion blur? A dream within a dream come doubly true. <laughs> Dream within a dream, see. So you are seeing a dream in a dream. It has beautiful colors, gorgeous patterns, what not, what not. You are hearing lovely music also. But that is happening. The dream is dreaming or seeing or hearing music in a dream. So you are still far away from that, you see. I don't know whether anybody has seen that kind of a thing. You see a dream and that dream is dreaming. <laughs> you see? You see? No, no. <laughs> yeah, it's a French movie. Yeah. Yeah. But, this, but this phrase, dream in a dream, is a very old dream. It is a very old phrase. It is there in some, some old poem, poems also. It's not a totally new phrase that way, dream in a dream. No, what I'm saying is, do you see any time a double dream like that? You are having a dream and then in that dream you are dreaming something. Sometimes you have a little glimpse of it. Sometimes you have a little glimpse of it, you see. <laughs> Be painted stiff on earth's vermilion blur. A dream a dream come doubly true. See, again, what a beautiful line, this double alliteration of R and D, a dream, a dream, double and R, three times R, three times D. The line is metrically, I mean, the, the sound wise, very beautiful line, a dream within a dream come doubly true. How shall the will of us become a star? So this is a dream and what you are seeing is only kind of a fluorescent phosphorescence on a marshy land. Glittering. They are not really there at all. Will is the past. You have got marshy places and suddenly you see sparks of light coming here sometimes in the night. So, and you call them stars. It's not true. How shall the will of the beast become a star? You want the divine to come here and live, but that is nothing but a will of the wisp. The ideal is a melody of thy mind. My dear girl, Savitri. <laughs> this is what it is. <laughs> this is what it is. How the ideal is a melody of thy mind. A bright delirium of thy speech and thought, a strange wine of beauty lift 
tempting thee to fall aside. So you are drunk too much of wine, <laughs> and now you are imagining all those things. You see. A noble fiction of thy yearnings made the human imperfection it must share. Is form in nature disappoint the heart, and never shall it find its heavenly shame, and never can it be fulfilled in time, and never can it be fulfilled in time. So that is the assertion of the great denier. You want that thing to happen in the course of time. Sorry, it cannot happen. It is an imagination. It's a dream. You have drunk some wine, and in the delirium, you are thinking of all those things. A noble fiction. So this whole creation is a noble fiction. We have. Great biography calling the whole of Savitri a fictional creation. It is called Savitri a fictional creation. So this is after all that. Pardon me. You don't like that. He says it's a fictional creation. <laughs> there is no truth in it. He is really the incarnation of this god of death. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and he dismisses the whole of Savitri in just one and half piece by saying it's a fictional creation. It's useless. Forget about it. Yeah, yeah. A noble fiction, but at least this man has a nobility of calling it a noble fiction. <laughs> Death has a nobility of calling a noble creation. No noble fiction. He doesn't say even a noble fictional creation. <laughs> A noble fiction of thy yearning made. So when I say talk about this kind of thing, noble fiction, sorry, fictional creation, then Jumur Bhattacharya sends me a memo and says you are not supposed to talk that <laughs> in the classes. You get out from knowledge. <laughs> yeah, you get out of knowledge. You see, she sends him. <laughs> a noble fiction of thy yearnings made. So these are the children of, well, thy human imperfection it must share. Its forms in nature disappoint the heart, and never shall it find its heavenly shame, and never can it be fulfilled in time. But this man is not telling me, all right, all that you are talking of will never happen in time. What Savitri is talking about, it can never happen in time. But then he is not telling me what is the time there for. <laughs> what is time there for, you see. What is time supposed to achieve? Do that he has to. I am. I got a little curiosity to know. In that case, you see, when he's talking, that never can be fulfilled in time. All right, I admit. But then, what is the time there for? Please tell me at least. No fiction. It's true and no fiction because our master cannot understand it like this. We call it fiction. Yeah. But it is, it is the noble, truth. So noble fiction. Is the truth, but what he described is that she won't submit to it. It is the truth. 
it, it is true. Okay. Yeah. Fiction. Fictional creation. Yeah. And that's why we said it cannot be in time. No, yeah, course, exactly. Because the truth cannot be in this time. In time, yeah. See, he says noble fiction, noble here. He is qualifying fiction by saying noble. In this case, he is qualifying the fiction by saying it noble fiction. Now, whether the fiction is noble, or your idea of what should happen is noble. You are talking about divine coming down. That is a noble thing. And the, but that is a fiction. So the adjective noble may not necessarily be for fiction. It could be your imagination, your idea of what you are proposing to do, what should happen, etc. That is a very noble, lofty thing. Just a lofty thing. But it's a fiction. So in that sense, noble fiction has a double meaning here, you see. And never, how do they say in French? Fiction. Fiction, huh? Yeah. Noble, noble. No, but uh, does it convey the double sense? What? Noble fiction, noble as an adjective for fiction, yes. or noble about her ideals being noble. Yes. Does it convey both the senses? No, yes. but the fiction, yeah, the word fiction is not always negative. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. For example, Fiction story and vice fiction, there is a truth. Yeah, because our mother cannot understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not necessary. Yeah. I like the truth. So he is therefore, so, and never can it be fulfilled. So that is the third law of thermodynamics. <laughs> the third law of thermodynamics says that time can never fulfill itself. The, the, the two laws of thermodynamics are stated in a negative statement. Heat by itself cannot flow from lower temperature to higher temperature. <laughs> cannot. See? Energy cannot be destroyed. That is the first law. I mean, I am simplifying it. So energy cannot be destroyed. It can be converted from one form to the other, but it cannot be destroyed or created. Not so. So both the laws are both the laws of thermodynamics are made as negative statements. The third law, which he is stating here, time can never fulfill what you are talking of can never be fulfilled in time. So that is the third law of thermodynamics <laughs> he is stating, giving us in terms of physics. Is it true? <laughs> And never can be fulfilled in time. O soul, misplayed by the splendor of thy thoughts. So he is rationalizing Savitri's own way of thinking by saying that she is misled by the glory, by the beauty, by the dazzle of her own ideas and of her own thoughts. O oh, soul, misplayed with the splendor of the thoughts. Of course, he is also making a great statement, great awkward statement, which is not really true. That a soul can be misled by thought. He is distorting truth. <laughs> soul cannot be misled by thought. Whether it is good thought or bad thought or whatever it is, Soul is soul, you see. So he is a great distorter, you see. O soul, misled by the splendor of thy thought. If he says, oh mind, oh my girl, then I can understand, you see. <laughs> but of course we can, we can uh, give him a little uh, benefit also that in the English language, soul is also used for a person. 
ஓ புவர் சோல் படை புவர் சோல் இது அரிசி வெரி புவர் சோல் சி ஓ சோல் மிஸ்லேட் பட் ஸ்பிளெண்டர் ஆஃப் தை தாட்ஸ் ஓ அர்த்லி கிரீச்சர் வித் தாய் ட்ரீம் ஆஃப் ஹேவன் ஒபே design and still the earthly law i have created this law for the earth obey it accept it see that is why death in the english sorry in the sanskrit tradition is called yama yama means law yama means law obey the earthly law and he is the master of the mortal world mrutyu loka we call it mrutyu loka this whole we are living in the mrutyu loka in the world of mrutyu of death therefore i am the lord i am the master of this mrutyu loka obey my law because you are misled by the splendor of your thoughts and i am giving you the proper guidance O oh, soul misled by the splendor of thy thought O oh, earthly creature with thy dream of heaven obey resign and still the earthly law accept the lie that falls upon thy days whatever little light is there little hope is there little glimpse is there because of mind because you have grown up through vig energy matter life mind thought you have grown up so whatever little light you have got you accept that light and live with that light accept the light that falls upon thy days take what thou canst of life's permitted joy submitting to the ordeal of fate's curse suffer for thou must of toil and grief and care suffer for thou must of toil and grief and care this ringing like a bell suffer for thou must of toil and grief and care suffer that starts with the trocky long shot suffer for thou must i will make an epist short short long for thou must of toil I am and grief and and care again I am you see suffer what thou must of toil and grief and care so all human consolation in spite of all his miseries lies in this particular advice given by death suffer what thou must yes toil is there grief is there care is there suffer and accept in other words he is talking of earthly law of mrutyu loka what is the earthly law what is nature of suffering of toil and grief and care he is characterizing the nature of this earthly world where the earthly law prevails the earthly law is of suffering of toil of grief of care he is elaborating on that you see submitting to the ordeal of fate's skull suffer for thou must of toil and grief and care almost monosyllabic except for the first foot there shall approach silencing the passionate heart my long calm night of everlasting sleep there end to the hush from which thou came retire so you have come in a mortal world accepting the law of mortality mrutyu loka you go back again and live in the mortal world forget about heaven etc etc the law here that prevails here is the law of death and you cannot escape and whatever peace you want 
whatever consolation you want, whatever hope, fulfillment you want, that will only because of me here. They are into the hush from, from which thou must retire, go back. That is what will happen, you see. Now, this is the strongest argument that can be put forward by the power who denies the possibility of a divine manifestation. So earlier we have seen in the previous canto practically the argument based on life and passion and emotion. Here we are seeing the sophistry of the argument based on thought, on mind, on reasoning. He has built up his argument now at a higher level. They are into the hush from we thou came. So what is the hush? You will go and get absorbed in my silence. In his silence. <laughs> so all the possibilities of your progress, of continuous progress, are at once terminated by him. You will go and sleep into the hush. It will be your total laya. The laya into the inconscious, into the void, utter void, even below inconscience. Inconscience is a great, great, great advance over void, as I told you. First is the utter void, then the inconscience, then matter, then ignorance. So the progress is very, how that progress has happened, of that we have no knowledge. The mother says there was nobody to write down the history of evolution that we at that time. I would have liked to see how things progressed. Millions of years. Yeah. Millions yeah. Of years. See, if I know how it happened that way, then I can work upon the process by which the transformation can be built up. So I had to build up now that knowledge first. That was her problem, you see. There shall I prove silencing the passionate heart, my long, calm night of everlasting sleep. There into the heart from me thou camest retire. See, you see, these are very cruel lines. Very harsh, very cruel lines. But the charm of the poetry, the yogic force which is there behind them, gives you a different kind of soothness. So that is the power of the yogi. Yogi has put, although he is talking of very harsh things, it does not really hurt you. It has a power of elevating you. The power of taking you up, taking you out of it. That is, while even you are talking of negative things, the power is that you are sort of pulled out of those negative things. That is the beauty of yogic poetry, you see. And that is exactly what should happen when you are doing any work, although it may be the dirtiest work, but that work should be such that it can really, it will really pull you out of that dirt. That pose, that occult element should be present in all our actions, in all our activities. So it may look very harsh, very cruel and all that thing, but it is not really cruel. You want to bring out something of beauty, something of truth, something of joy, then it becomes creative. So this is what happens in the case of uh, painters. <laughs> they, they, they paint all kind of dirty things, but the subconscious is there, so degrading, it has no power at all to pull you out of that, you see. It has no power. Here, he is talking of death. They are into the harsh from which thou must desire, retire. See, he is talking of that. But it does not really push you down into the harsh of that kind. It has the power to pull you out of it. You see. Now, of course, Savitri had to give a long, big answer. Savitri had to give a long answer for uh, uh, what he has been talking of, you see. So she is going to give him a couple of lessons on the life divine. <laughs> <laughs>
he is going to give a couple of lessons on life divine. Mr. Death, you please read chapter so and so in life divine. <laughs> Yeah, because you are ignorant, it doesn't mean it. Yeah, that's right, exactly. <laughs>